said that I am God, a very God. We thank you this morning, oh God. Father, do what only you can do. Turn the foolishness of preaching into healing, salvation, and deliverance. Do only what you can do. But take the fallenness of man and put your glory on it. That they can say, thus saith the Lord. Father, break the yoke in this house. Karabo seki. Father, contaminate, oh God, the agenda of the principalities with your holiness and your glory. Use frail manhood to defy demons, even in this house now, God. Father, in all our celebrations of life, we celebrate you, oh God. This is your hour. This is your moment. Receive my words today that your people, Lord God, would be transformed. Let the church say amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Take your seats. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you to Pastor Devon Thompson and his beautiful wife, Evangelist Thompson, to Pastor Kerr, Minister Lindsay. Fantastic. Uh, study today we do need a debate in the church the scripture says let us reason together praise the lord to the mothers in the church mother thompson to all of the evangelists and the missionaries to these wonderful panel of musicians to the wives to the wives that's the hardest office out here you know that wife office men don't underestimate that that's a hard office these days and to my Trini friend, I bring in Trini people in here. I'm going to pack up this place with Trini people. God bless you. Eternal Jamaican. Imagine that. <laughs> but God bless you this morning. I, I, I never take it for granted at the amazing opportunity that, that we are afforded to, to speak behind the holy desk and to say, thus saith the Lord, to allow the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to rest in the minds of men so that the things that come out of our mouths sound coherent and that we can say amen to. I, I, I think it's the most uh, amazing gift. One of the things I wish I could do was, was play instruments. And I think it's such a fantastic gift. My brain and hand coordination doesn't, doesn't work for it. I, I really thought I was going to be, uh, you know, some kind of fantastic basketball player. And, and in, my, in my mind, I was for a minute. But this is the gift that lasts. And, and I thank God for, for this gift. Um, and it truly is a gift. And, and that's why we should never boast about what God affords us in the gospel. The Holy Spirit, you know, took a gentleman that really didn't like to speak, didn't like to talk publicly, had a very bad memory, had a very bad temper. And somehow in the, in the comedic realm of eternity, God transformed him into... Um, a bishop. So, again, humility first. And uh, I just, I just thank you that you like to listen to this old Trini man talk a few times. And Pastor Thompson, you know, he likes to give me some opportunity. So I appreciate you, man of God, and and your wonderful family, wonderful family. Desiree boy, all the clothes that Desiree have, you guys just kept sewing the same, same. All they had to do is show all Desiree's shoes. It would have made about 100 slides. 100 slides. But happy birthday to you. I'm, I'm sure you guys enjoyed your birthday. I, I, was, I was trying to crash the birthday, but, but Shelby said, no, it's, 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 on, it's on lock. So I, I save a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Appreciate you very much. But I was, was, was going to crash it, Pastor. I was going to crash it and harass her. You know, you know Desiree already. Stoic. I, know, I don't know what I would have done, but I would have done something to, to embarrass her or something. But it's always next year. Yes. Amen. <laughs> God blocked it. <laughs> That's the devil. Genesis chapter 16. Let us preach a, a little message here and allow you to get on your way because I'm really looking forward to the food. I, I, mean, I mean, no, I didn't mean that. Yes, I did. I'm really looking forward to I like. I like this particular Sunday. Brother Cedric, because I know there's food after, and when I don't, when I don't see Chris in the service all the time, I know he's downstairs, 
and Travis, something, something good is coming. Amen. So let's make sure they don't burn the food. So we have a few scriptures to read. For those who don't read the Bible during the week, you're going to get a lot today. Um, you sanctified saints that don't read Bibles. It's terrible when I preach because I'm just going to preach the whole thing to you. But Genesis chapter 16, we'll start with uh, verse 5 to 16. Genesis chapter 16, verse 5 to 16. I'm only going to ask you to stand for the last one because there's so many. Um, but I'm going somewhere today. Uh, I have a word for you today. And I have a word for us today. And I have a word for me today. But Genesis chapter 16, verse 5. And the Bible says, And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Hmm. And the Lord judge between me and thee. This is Sarah saying, I shouldn't have given the woman to you. As soon as she had a child, as soon as she had a child, she thought she was the boss. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Hmm. No wonder the Muslim feels he's nice. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thine affliction. We praise the Lord. Genesis chapter 18, verse 12 to 15. It says, Therefore Sarah, laughed, she's not Sarai anymore, she's Sarah, laughed within herself saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure in my Lord being old also? She says, how are us two old people going to do this thing, God? And the Lord said unto Abraham, he's Abraham now, wherefore did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? God be checking those words. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denied saying, I laughed not because she was afraid. And he said, nay, you did laugh. You did laugh. Genesis 37, second last one. Genesis 37, verse 17. Genesis 37, verse 17. All the way to 28. Genesis 37, verse 17. And the man said, they are departed hence, and I heard them. Let us go to Dothan. Joseph asking, where are his brothers? And Joseph went after his brethren, and he found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to kill him, to slay him. And said one to another, behold, the dreamer cometh. Behold, now, come now, therefore, and let us kill him. Let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him. 
and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come down unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites. Here comes Ishmael again. Okay. And Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit it is that we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Here comes Ishmael. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. However, then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. They bought Joseph into Egypt. Last scripture, and for those who couldn't stand before, if you'll stand with me, we're going to the book of Numbers. Um, Numbers 14, starting in verse 5 to verse 9, then we'll skip down the page. Numbers chapter 14, verse 5 says, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces, before all of the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent, tore their clothes. And they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, and if he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey, only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread. Hallelujah. They are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Four more verses, verse 20 to 24, and we shall sit down. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, and all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness... And have tempted me now these ten times. And have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb. Because he had another spirit in him. Touch yourself and say I've got another spirit in me. And has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land. Wherewith he went. And his seed shall possess it. Your neighbor doesn't know this. But just look across them and say. I am different. I got another spirit in me. Please take your seats. I'm different. I've got another spirit in me. The rejected, the barren, 
the afflicted, and the underestimated, the rejected, the barren, the afflicted, and that dangerous last one, the underestimated. Many times when you look at your life, you have to ask yourself, God, why on earth would you have allowed this? You said you're a loving God. You said you are the lamp unto my feet. You said that a righteous man's steps are ordered by the Lord. In the words of a countryman from Trinidad, what kind of bacchanal have you allowed in my life? The African would say, what kind of wahala are you allowing in my life? What kind of sit in this are you allowing in my life? Abraham decided that in a famine that he was going to go and hang out in Egypt. When he got to Egypt, he had a brilliant plan. He said, listen, you're old, but you look good, you know. Black don't crack, you know. And Sarai, they're going to want to do harm to me just to get you. So tell them you're my sister. And so she did. And Pharaoh heard about this beautiful woman coming from the other side of the Euphrates. A woman speaking a different tongue with her brother who looked different than the Egyptians looked. I said, I need to get this woman in my, my company. And he found out where they were. And he blessed Abram and took his wife, hopefully to be his. I guess there's nothing more powerless than a man in a position where he has to live with his lie. And so he couldn't change his tune. And said, wait, wait, he had to go with it. You ever been stuck in a bad plan? <laughs> stuck in a bad plan with no backup. And Abraham is sitting there thinking, I wonder what Pharaoh is doing with my wife right now. God understanding the potential of a man's brain. Said even before this man gets to Egypt, even before he leaves his father's house, I'm going to make sure that it is well established that this woman is barren. Think about these things. The man marries a woman hoping to have children. And the woman cannot have children. She's barren. She's barren. Think of the concept of this barrenness. The barrenness is what God held as a carrot in order to get Abram to leave his father's house. Came to Abram. He says, God, I don't have any, anybody to inherit. My servant is my heir. He says, no. You shall have a child of your own flesh, but you must leave your father's house. The calamity of the barrenness is actually the catapult that pushes him into his purpose. Sometimes what went bad for you is what God is using to do something good for you. Sarah's barren, but he loves her. He, he don't want to leave her. He can. He can get something else. But there's a connection to the calamity. There's a connection to the situation. And you don't even understand it. And so God pushes him out of his father's house. And Sarai, Sarai is the potential in you that you don't see. <laughs> the Abram. Not the Abraham. The Abram and the Sarai. You still hear from God. You still pray. You still hope. But when God tells it to you, you laugh. 
Because the reality of how long you've been barren is more real than whatever God is saying now. I've been jacked up, messed up, broke. I've been, I've been so bad. God, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have a pot to do nothing in. I didn't have anything. I'm, I'm so jacked up. How can you say I'm blessed? I have an institutional knowledge of how messed up I am. That people call me by that name. People know me by that. You've got a nickname of, of, of jacked up. She's been barren forever. Sarai. And because she knows that she could not possibly do anything that God said. <laughs> the oxymoron. Because I know that because God said it is still impossible because it's me. Imagine that dilemma of your mind. Even what God says to me must be impossible because it's me. She says, remember when you were lying in Egypt and they gave you all these money and they gave you this servant? I got an Egyptian here that looks like she can actually fulfill what God is saying. Sarai will transfer her blessing to someone else because of the brokenness of what she sees of herself in the mirror. Abram will accept a broken promise in the, in the mouth of an individual connected to him, but having so much doubt, he says, I guess you're right. Abraham heard from God. Sarai heard from God. And none of them believed them. Abram and Sarai. So she says, go have Hagar here. Go have Hagar. Just take Hagar. The old man was excited. That young African must have looked good. He didn't say no at all. Don't tempt your husband with that, ladies. <laughs> Don't tempt your husband with that at all. And he married old Hagar, young Hagar rather. And then something takes place in the revelational mind. The prophecy starts to make sense somehow. When Sarai sees that Hagar conceives and sees the posture change in Hagar because now there's a promise in Hagar. Hagar can detect the promise in her. To the point where she looks at the barrenness of Sarah and says, you can't, Sarai rather, you can't compare to this baby. I'm carrying promise. Sarai sees Hagar full of promise and says, oh God, what have I done? What have I done? Have you ever been in a place? Where you realize that what you had was absolutely perfect, was fine, was complete. You just needed time for it to mature. But you aborted it and then got to the place where you see it now in someone else's life. You see the same circumstance, blessing somebody else. And you said, my God, what have I done? Amen. It is so hard. Watch this. It is, it is so hard for the human mind to follow a divine principle. But it is so easy for the human mind, the unfallen human mind, the unfallen, the unsinful human mind to say, i rather fall in a, follow a human directive than a divine directive. I can prove it. It is easier for me, you, and everybody in this room to listen to our neighbor than to listen to God. It's much easier. Adam and Eve are two perfect people without sin, in a perfect garden, with given perfect instructions. And still, when given another natural opportunity route 
in a different direction. It was easier for Eve to listen to the devil. It was easier for Adam to eat from his wife than to remember the divine paradigm. It is part of your humanity. Your inability to listen to God is part of your humanity. Don't be discouraged. We all have it. God has created it in you from the very beginning. So therefore, the ear that can hear from God has to be an ear that rejects listening to man. This is why when Peter tried to talk to Jesus and said, oh, no, no, you're not going to be crucified. Jesus immediately said, what did he say? Satan, get thee behind me. He didn't see his friend as Peter anymore. He saw the devil speaking because it would have been easy to listen to flesh. The arm of flesh is a good friend sometime, you know, but it will fail. And so now as Hagar is, is, is full of promise, Sarai goes and appeals to the higher court of Abram. And Abram says, she's your servant. Do with her what you want. Wow. Now the man in me says, Abram, what's wrong with you? What, what is the matter with you? Like, you, you you've, you've, this woman is pregnant. This, it's your child. And you, you've, you've never had any children before. And you just allow her to cast her into the wilderness. See, this is a moment where I believe that the Abram, the Abram in us, is stuck waiting for God to give us hard answers. Was that a good choice? Was that the right decision? Was that the right thing to tell her? He tells Sarai, go and Tell this lady to leave then. And she flees. But God sees her in the wilderness. God says, no. It is not your season to leave. Because we know she eventually leaves. But it is not your season to leave. Go back to your mistress. Go back and submit yourself to her. Because even things that are sometimes out of joint and out of the way. God says that I will cover your error. I will allow the season of your frailty to be protected by me, even though I know there comes a time I've got to separate you. Amen. Sends her back. Allows her to have the child. Tells her the name of the child. Puts the promise on the child. The rejected, but still with a purpose. Anybody in this house? Have you ever felt rejected, been rejected? Thinking, what are you doing to me, God? But still there's purpose on you. Still, I'm going to say it again. You're rejected, but there's purpose on you. It's in you. It's waiting for germination. It's waiting to come forth. Purpose, still here, jacked up, but still got purpose. Could have called it that too. A generation passes the baby inside of Hagar becomes a nation and the separation of those two nations seemingly going in opposite direction but God will use rejection to save the promise Joseph about to be killed by his own brothers but the hearing that the Ishmaelites are there, <laughs> the presence of Ishmael, the presence of the Ishmaelites changes the mentality of murder to merchandism. Why kill him when we can profit from him? Why kill him when we can get something out of this? But the very appearance of the Ishmaelites Changes the trajectory of what the brothers planned for. Hallelujah. 
even sometimes the maturing of what was formerly rejected can still have a way of coming back to bless you. Oh, I got scripture for it. The stone that the builders rejected shall become the chief cornerstone. God says, I can still have promise in rejection. If you give me enough time, hallelujah, I can take rejection. I can mature it. And I can cause it to save a promise from the pit. In the fortuitousness of how God operates, God says this, I believe in the backdrop of his mind, even though you think that I'm going to let Ishmael bless you for cursing what is the promise, I won't. Hallelujah. And God intercedes with the Midianites. Who are the Midianites? This is, this is, this is advanced. <laughs> this is going further, but the Midianite was the saving entity that Moses had to flee to when he murdered somebody in Egypt and had to find a way to find God with the Midianites. God is using the Midianites as an incubator state, as an incubator nation, as an incubator group, so that when his promised man is mature, hallelujah, he can look and say, what is on that mountain? The Midianite comes and says, you will not prosper from this young man in the pit. The Midianite picks him out of the pit before the brothers can get him to sell him to the Ishmaelites. And the Midianites sell him to the Ishmaelites. And Ishmael carries him to Egypt. Hallelujah. A full circle. Ishmael carrying Abram's seed back to Egypt when Abram took Hagar out of Egypt. Woo! God will bring about a full circle. I was a bond woman out of Egypt. And now I am selling what sold me or what bought me back into Egypt. You've got to be careful how you play with people's lives. You've got to be careful how you play with people's lives. If they would have thrown Hagar out and she would have died in that wilderness, there would have been no Ishmaelites to save the promise. Woo. Why am I calling Joseph the promise? Joseph is truly the firstborn son, not Reuben. I'm going to play with that. Leah is not the woman that Jacob really wanted. He wanted Rachel. Reuben is Leah's firstborn. But Joseph is Rachel's firstborn. This is why the father treats him like he is the promised child. This is why the brothers identify that we don't like him because we know he's father's preference. But the worst part about Joseph and you know it, is that the dream is in Joseph. The dream is in you. The dream that cannot be killed. The dream that cannot be starved, even though they throw you in a pit with no water. You think you're going to throw me in a pit? I, I look at the Bible sometimes and I say, why does it say a pit with no water? Because God wants to make sure they didn't just try to kill you. They tried to starve you. And they tried to make sure you had no, they thirsted you out. They were making sure you were dry. They were making sure you were too deep to get up. They were making sure you were too empty to be full. A pit with no water. And so now. You've got to go through your Egyptian experience again You're ex we know what happens Egyptian experience 400 years we know what happens Joseph goes up the ladder becomes the second in charge his name means Yahweh shall add but after a Pharaoh who never knew him takes over 
We know the story. 400 years in Goshen oppression. 400 years slavery. 400 years God leaving you in the same bondage that you... <laughs> 400 years. But then it's time to leave. It's time to get out of that place. The rejected, the barren, the afflicted, the underestimated. It's time to leave that place. But what you have been cultured to behave like, to think like, to behave, to, 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 to act like, is a slave. You're a slave. 400 years of institutional slavery passed down to you. 400 years of bad culture. 400 years of not knowing how to stand on your own. Have you ever been in a place where you're inheriting the behavior of your parents. They're dealing with you because, because that's how they were dealt with. So listen. Every Caribbean person knows what it means when they say, I, ha yeah, I, had, a, my, my, I had a Caribbean mother. Every, every, if she was single, she was different than if she was married a little bit. Right now, I still have PTSD from the amount of dishes I have washed in my life. And you know, it's not just washing the dish. You have to, you have to wipe down the counter. They come in there, you say, can I go outside now? I'm done. Let me see what that kitchen looks like. This sink is still wet, Wendell. Go in there and you dry down the sink again. Can I go outside now? Let me see what that looks like. Come in there. That towel, you didn't hang up the towel that you dried the sink. And you're coming in there and now you're trying to wrap this towel up. Can I, can I go outside now? Open up the closet. These glasses are, you put these wet glasses inside here. Pastor Kirk, I was a very large boy at seven. So my mother felt that she had a man in the house to do all this work. She had her, she had her own furniture mover. Okay? She had her, she, she told me that the, the dishwasher, she was saving it for her old age. In 1977, you're saving a dishwasher for your old age? <laughs> Everybody knows what it's like to be culturally brought up in a situation. And then, when you get your own children, this sink, this, this sink ain't, this sink, Jericho, this sink ain't dry. <laughs> you don't know how to parent any other way. You're doing the same foolishness they did to you. <laughs> Cultured. 400 years of it. They're in the wilderness. Every second something goes wrong in the wilderness. Well, well, well Moses, you should have just left us in Egypt. You should have just left us to die in Egypt. <laughs> Moses gets to the point where he says, God, listen to me. I, I, I don't care if you kill me, I'm not taking these people nowhere. <laughs> God doesn't even deal with the fact that Moses is going through so much trauma. God has, God has time. He has more time. But they get to the place where they even wear out God. Ten times these people have, have they have not. Moses, God has to sit down with Moses. And God, listen, Moses has to counsel God. These people... God says, these people, I've, I've, I've done signs. I've done miracles. I'm going to kill all of them. God says, please. Moses says, please, please, God. Just, just take it easy. Relax. Take a seat. Take, take. <laughs> ah! 
They wear out God himself till Moses has to, has to step in and counsel God. And God says, okay. He, he exhales. He does, he does the prayer to the exhales. <sighs> Because today we are saying that, that God is not compulsive. I don't know about that. When you watch him, when you watch him, he's very emotional. He's very emotional. He loves you, but he's very emotional. He's quite punitive. And he says, okay, Moses, I hear you. You're right. But I tell you what. Not a single one of them is getting into the promise. Not a one of them. I'm going to kill all of them in the wilderness. <laughs> God is a trini for sure. We have a shirt like that in Trinidad. God is a trini. He lives here. Might be. It's his other passport. And God says, none of them are getting in. Their, their carcasses will all be dead in the wilderness. He's very descriptive. But then Joshua and Caleb get up. And they said, God. And the people. He says, I want to sh This land that God has told us about. Whew, this land, is, it's flowing with milk and honey. The vision that they had was different than the vision of the other ten. God is looking to see what you see as your victory. Does your victory look like somebody is going to overwhelm you or does your victory look like bread? He says, they say, the people are like bread for us. We shall devour them. They have nothing to keep us from them. Who? How do you see the prospect of your conflict? When God listens to those two speak, he knows the plans he has for Joshua, so he doesn't mention Joshua, which was interesting to me. But he says, I will kill all of them in the wilderness. Except for Caleb. He has a different spirit. Ooh. I said to myself, what kind of spirit is this, God? I, I need to have this spirit. Caleb is from the line of Judah. Ooh. Comes back to our theme. Comes back to our theme in 2 Chronicles. When God is looking... To see who can deal with conflict. He is looking to see first and foremost who has the DNA of praise on the inside of you. An individual with the DNA of praise will never look at their conflict as something that is too much for them. Caleb, we don't even know who he is. The whole time that Israel is going in Egypt, we never hear Caleb. The whole time that Israel is trying to get themselves out of Pharaoh's hands, we never hear about Caleb. The whole time that the Red Sea is being opened up, we never hear about Caleb. We only hear about Caleb when it's time to fight. There's a Caleb on the inside of you that God is looking at and saying, I have seen how you deal with your conflict. There's a Caleb in you ready to praise and to fight. I wish I had a church. That said in their spirit, whoa, I'm different. I don't see the world like everybody else sees it. I don't see my issues like everybody else sees it. I see my issues like Caleb. I know it's big. I know there's a giant. I know there's a principality. But all I see is food. Whoa. I've got a different spirit. I've got a spirit ready to change the world. I've got a spirit ready to turn the world upside down. I know there's only 11 of us. And, 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 they, and, they, and this guy Judas is gone. But the apostle said, I've got a different spirit in me. To turn the world upside down. 
I believe that when you look at the Pentecostal, the Pentecostal is the church that is still growing out of all the other churches. The Roman Catholic Church is not growing. The United Church is not growing. The Methodist Church is not growing. But we are the church that says we stand on praise. We've got a different spirit. A spirit that says it doesn't matter what I've been through. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. It doesn't matter what you call me. It doesn't matter what I've actually done. It doesn't matter what jail that I've come out of. I've got a different spirit. Joseph said, listen, I want you to make sure that you don't leave my bones. <laughs> That's prophecy. Don't leave my bones here. Imagine a prophecy 400 years later. He said, listen, one day God is going to take us out of here. Joseph said it when everything was good, but he realized that that wasn't his place. Hallelujah. He realized that he was still out of place. He realized that the birthright and the blessing that he handed over to Egypt, if his brothers had not done what they had done, then Jacob would have inherited all of it. Jacob would be like Pharaoh. Jacob would have had the dream. Jacob would have had the prophecy. Jacob would have had the provision. And so even though he knows he's standing in Egypt and he's at the head and he's doing everything big, he looks back down the annals of time and he says, I remember when they rejected Ishmael. I remember when that I was just a stranger in the land and I realized this is not my place that one day God will lift me up and take us out of this place. Take my bones with me. Take my bones with you. I'm different. I'm different. In the name of Jesus. Father, I declare over this congregation that they have a different spirit. Father, they've got a spirit for healing. Right now, if you need a healing, come to this altar. I've got a different spirit. The doctors have said one thing, but God, I see conflict as bread. In the name of Jesus Christ, I shall not be blind. In the name of Jesus Christ, I shall not be consumed with boils and sores. In the name of Jesus Christ, the circumstances of my life shall not be my epitaph. Oh, this is not my ending. I've got a different spirit. Father, right now, even in this place, move through this house. Identify the Judah encapsulated in Caleb and begin to do what only you can do. Declare over them that they will outlive their peers. Let me say one last thing before I pray. Caleb still had to live 40 years in the wilderness. He didn't get to go straight to the promised land. He had to watch everybody die around him. He had to watch his friends die. His relatives die. His loved ones die. Because he knew there was a promise on his life that was not going to leave him in that place. There is a blessing in this house today. That God is about to establish longevity in you. And you have to have the tenacity to go through it. Tell somebody I'm going to go through it. He still had to wait for manna to fall. He still had to be thirsty and beg for Ab or Moses to break the stone so they could be water. He still had to fight in wars. He still had to deal with fear. But he had a different spirit. Father, now in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yahweh, the I Am. These are those that have a different spirit. Rest your Shekinah on them. Rest your Shekinah on them. Hear their faith. You were examining Caleb when no one knew who he was. He was underestimated. I present to you the underdogs in this house. I present to you the underestimated. 
I present to you those who declare that they will go before you, O oh God, and do as you call them to do. Father, now examine your people in this house. Examine your people in this house. Examine the barren. Examine the rejected. Hallelujah. Examine the afflicted. Examine the underestimated. And breathe over all of them a different spirit. A different spirit. Hallelujah. I declare over your life that you are battle tested. I declare over your life that you are battle tested. Karabosata, your spirit is battle tested. They don't know your resume. They don't know what you've lived through. Battle tested. They don't know what you've had to suffer. They don't know what you've had to cry by yourself. Battle tested. They don't know when they people left you and people rejected you. Battle tested. It is your time to rise. It is your time to see your conflict is but bread. Yeshua HaMashiach, the God of everything. We need you. We need you, oh God. Don't forget, like, comment, and subscribe as we share the word of God through Emmanuel Church of Jesus Christ.